And then, um, I guess, uh, we decided with session 14, then to G plus two. And uh, I think our first speaker should be Jordan uh, Carroll. But then we see Nico on stage now. Is Jonathan here? Nicola, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Do yes. you want to get started instead of Jonathan? Um, yeah, I can go first if that, okay. if that helps. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Nicola. Okay. All right. Hopefully, you can all see my screen. Hopefully, that worked. Okay. I will assume that everyone can see my screen, and I will uh, just get started. Um. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I'm Nicola, I'm a data scientist at Jumping Rivers, uh, where I do all sorts of things with R, including uh, building Shiny apps, uh, data science consultancy, and running training courses in R, including for ggplot2. Um, and that's, I'm gonna be talking to you about learning ggplot2 with generative art. So first of all, uh, what is generative art? I quite like this definition of generative art from the Tate Gallery. So generative art is art made using a predetermined system that often includes an element of chance. So randomness and rules, essentially. Uh, so people who make generative art in, tend to call it either artistry or art with a capital R. Um, I definitely recommend uh, having a look at those Twitter hashtags if you, if you want to see some kind of cool looking stuff made in R. So why is generative art useful when it comes to uh, learning ggplot2? Well, I believe that we tend to learn new things for one of two reasons. Either we have to, or we want to. Okay, so let's say you're a data analyst and you're new a two, and you need to make some plots, some bar charts or line charts, for example. The truth is that you don't really need to learn ggplot2 um, in order to use it. The documentation for ggplot2 is really good. A quick Google search of ggplot2 bar chart will give you a full example of a bar chart. And all you need to do is sort of copy paste and change a variable name. Okay, I'm sure we've all done that at some point and sometimes we still do. Um, but it makes it quite difficult to motivate yourself to actually learn how ggplot2 works if you don't need to. In contrast, you can't Google generative art. Okay, well, you can, but you get what I'm trying to say. So art is experimental. There are no sort of right answers. So it's a really nice way to sort of get to grips with what ggplot can do, especially the more sort of stylistic elements of it. So trying to make your plots look a bit nicer. And also it's, it's fun, okay? So take these two plots, for example, okay? Um, what are the differences uh, between these two plots? Okay, technically, this is a bit of a trick question. Okay, a better question would be what's not different. Okay, and the answer to that is the data. Okay, this is exactly the same data set visualized in two different ways. The only difference lies in which ggplot2 functions we're actually applying. So I think this is a really nice example that shows what the functions in ggplot2 can do. And if you know how to use it well, you can create things that no one can tell were ever created in R, which always sounds like a slightly odd compliment to me, but um, I would argue that ggplot2 is kind of far more than a data visualization package. It's a kind of fully fledged design tool, okay? So what I want to show you today is a couple of examples of some generative art and the techniques I've used to create them. And I'm also gonna show you how I've sort of taken some of the techniques or functions that I've used in generative art and applied them to create more traditional data visualization plots. Okay, so first example, right? 
ggplot2 is built on the kind of principle of layers, okay? The idea that you can create complex plots by building them up a layer at a time, okay? From a technical perspective, when we uh, look at the layer function and the definition, a layer is a combination of data, stat, and geom with a potential position adjustment, okay? So you can combine layers with different data sets, different geoms, i.e. different types of charts, different statistical transformations and different positionings of those geoms and stats. For me though, I kind of think there's one thing missing from this function, which means there's one thing you can't do easily, and that's combine different coordinate systems or sort of different scales on the same axis. Okay, these elements aren't part of the layer functions, so you can't sort of layer them naturally. You might have come across this, for example, if you've been plotting spatial data, with different coordinate reference systems, you might get some sort of warning, or your plot comes out looking not quite how you expected. Um, that's because ggplot2 won't let you set two coordinate systems at the same time. It will always sort of use the most recent one. Similarly for axes, you can't combine data or geoms that have different axis scales on the same plot. So for example, you can't have some one geom using sort of scale x log 10 and a second geom with scale x square root on the same plot okay and for the most part that probably makes complete sense okay that's going to be a very difficult to interpret plot if you try to do those two things at the same time okay. but when it comes to generative r we don't care about interpreting data correctly so i kind of had to find a way around that to let me create those layers that ggplot2 didn't want me to create and then I've kind of later used what I found through generative art to create the other plots that ggplot2 doesn't want you to make. So I think a big pro of sort of programmatically creating plots in something like R, in contrast to a user interface application, is that you should have full control over the output. Even if the output is a bad idea, I think you should still be able to make it, okay? So this first example that I'm gonna show you is uh, bar charts, okay? Um, and it's about how to layer different plots um, that might not layer naturally in ggplot2 at first. Okay, so these are uh, a few examples of combining multiple bar charts in ggplot2. These are all just simple bar charts with polar coordinates. Okay, now if you take a closer look, you can see that there are multiple bar charts layered on top of each other. Okay, if you imagine it without the polar coordinates for a second, what you essentially have here is one bar chart where the x-axis is fixed between, say, 1 and 50. So you have 50 categories. And then you have a second bar chart where the x-axis is fixed between 1 and 100. So you have 100 categories. Okay. And if I try to layer these on the same plot, ggplot will use the last specified x-axis limits for my plot. Okay. So the way I eventually got around this was by using the patchwork package. Okay, so it's technically not a pure ggplot2 secret. Um, so for those of you maybe not familiar with the patchwork package, it's kind of an add-on or a companion package to ggplot2 that makes it very easy to arrange multiple ggplots into a single graphic. If you have used patchwork before, what you might not know about it is that as well as arranging plots that are side by side or in a grid, it also lets you layer them on top of each other. Okay. So I'm going to show you more specifically how I ended up using the same idea for a kind of more traditional data visualization. Okay. So this example was actually inspired by a question I was asked when I was running a training course on graphics in R. Um, an attendee brought me a plot they'd made. I think it was in something like a uh, Sigma plot and said, how do I make this using ggplot? And my initial answer was, well, you can't. You're going to get an error message if you try to make that. Um, but given how much I like ggplot2, it kind of annoyed me um, until I figured out a slightly unconventional way to do it. Um, the same way that I'd previously used in the generative art I've just uh, shown you. Okay. So for this example, let's say you've made a bar chart and you've also made a line chart and they share the same x-axis. Okay. What you want to do is layer the line plot on top of the bar chart and have a secondary axis. The problem is that ggplot2 isn't actually equipped to handle a secondary axis. Okay? The secondary y-axis on the right-hand side is simply a copy or a transformation of the left y-axis. And in this example, ggplot2 doesn't really know how to transform the discrete axis 
on the left into a continuous axis on the right. Now, if you're really, really, really lucky and the range of the y-axis for your line chart happens to lie between one and 10, so the number of bars on the bar chart, this actually works perfectly first time, which I was very surprised by, okay? But if your data doesn't lie between one and 10 and you try to transform the range of this, you get a nice little error, okay? That I'm sure many of us have seen before. You get this sort of discrete and continuous axis incompatibility. So instead, we use patchwork. And instead of just layers of geomes, we're now trying to construct layers of ggplots. Okay. Now, the key function here is inset element. Okay. So assuming P1 is our bar chart and P2 is our line chart that we want to layer on top, the first thing we need to do is use the theme function from ggplot2 to remove the background elements from our line chart, so the grid lines, white background, etc., because we'll be using the um, the sort of underlying background from the bar chart instead. The second thing we need to do is specify how we want the different layers to overlap. Okay, So setting the left, right, bottom, and top arguments stretches our line chart to fill up the grid below, and we set a line to equals full to stretch it to the full size of the graphic below, rather than just the plot panel area, for example. And this gives us the, the desired result. Okay, so the great thing about this is that just like layers of geomes, you can also have as many layers of ggplots as you like. So when you come across that kind of incompatibility of, of layers of geomes, we can kind of use patchwork to layer up the ggplots instead. Okay. I think this example was sort of one of the first times I was actually able to fix a problem in ggplot uh, to, as a result of something I'd learned through kind of experimenting with generative art. Okay. And now I just want to quickly run through um, a few more examples of some other functions, specifically other geomes uh, that I hadn't really used before I started playing with generative art and some kind of thoughts on why they might be useful. Okay, so first up is geom path. Okay, so before I started doing generative art, I'd never really used geom path. Okay, I've been using its kind of sister uh, geom line on an almost daily basis for displaying time series data. So where a geom line connects observations in order of the variable on the x-axis, geom path connects those observations in the order in which they appear in the data. Okay. So although probably still used less often than geom line for me, um, I found it really useful for sort of plotting positions or trajectories. Okay. So when you have a time as a variable, but you don't want to put it on the x-axis. So for example, maybe showing how a scatter plot evolves over time. I can kind of see this working quite well as a sort of static alternative to animated plots with ggAnimate. Um, so anything sort of looking at uh, evolution over time of multiple variables. So next up uh, is Geom Polygon. Okay, so Geom Polygon is actually very similar uh, to Geom Path, except the endpoints are connected and you can control the sort of inner color using the fill argument. Okay, so I have used this uh, a little bit in sort of data science work. I um, found it very useful for uh, mapping, so working with spatial data um, and sort of overlaying irregular polygons on maps. So something like the outline of a building on top of a map uh, you can construct uh, using Geom Polygon. Um, also potentially useful for highlighting um, something like a critical region on a scatter plot. Um, I've also used it for adding triangles um, into sort of flowchart diagrams and things. Essentially, it's quite useful for anything that's a predictable shape, um, but that isn't a rectangle. It's quite easy to actually draw that with, uh, with Geom Polygon. Okay. And uh, finally, Geom Raster. Okay, so I had actually used Geom Raster before to make heat maps. Um, similarly to the way you use sort of Geom Tile, you have a kind of square grid um, with the, the tiles colored by a variable. Um, so for this kind of sort of fractals inspired art, the data is actually calculated iteratively as a series of points. So naturally, I initially rendered it using Geom Point, but it was taking a really long time and it got very frustrating very quickly. Um, and I eventually ended up geom using Geom Raster instead. 
Um, so this essentially creates a grid of equally sized rectangles and then colors them in. Um, and it was so much quicker. I knew it would be quicker, but I didn't realize sort of how much quicker. Okay, so 0.6 seconds compared to like five and a half, so almost 10 times faster. Okay, and this is something I'm kind of currently experimenting with in terms of scatter plots. Okay, so for me at least, scatter plots tend to be my first exploratory plot. Um, and when you're working with big data sets, they do take a really long time to render. Okay, you can plot a sample of your data instead, but sometimes you do just want to plot all of your data. Um, I'm kind of experimenting with the idea of whether plotting extra empty squares with GeoMaster uh, might actually still be quicker than using Geom points just with the data you actually have. Um, so yeah, there are lots of other kind of functions and ideas that I've had the chance to play around with thanks to gener generative art uh, that I don't have time to talk about today. Um, I hope this talk has been useful and maybe inspired you to try out some generative art in R, either as a way of learning some new things about ggplot2 or just because you want to have some fun. Um, either way, uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, please reach out if you do have any questions. OK, uh, thank you, Nicole. Um, I currently see uh, no questions uh, in the Q&A se section nor in the session chat. So and nobody comes up with a question. So um, then there's no more questions. Uh, thanks for jumping in. Um, and let's continue with our uh, now second speaker, uh, Jonathan, uh, please. Uh, Thank you. Sorry about before. It's very early here. Uh, I'm going to share a pre-recorded video. I'll be talking to you about GGEasy, which provides easy access to ggplot2 commands. I love ggplot. I think it's a fantastic implementation of the grammar of graphics. I think it's really been transformative for bringing visualizations of data to R, and I think it's helped countless users craft the visualizations and really help tell the story of their data. The default theme that ggplot uses is reasonable. There's nothing bad about it, but you probably want to make some changes to it. In this example, I'm plotting the empty cars dataset, plotting the mpg variable on the x-axis, the hp variable on the y-axis, and using a point geom and a smooth geom. The theme that's used here has a grey background, plain text, nothing too crazy, fairly simple, fairly reasonable. Themes in ggplot are a powerful way to change the non-data components of a plot. Text, fonts, backgrounds, grid lines, legends, things like that. Things that don't go into the aesthetics term. And there are lots of arguments. It's very flexible. The theme command itself, the formal arguments, are these, plus these, plus these. There's lots of flexibility because it's so powerful and you can change any of these components. Of course, you wouldn't change those components manually. There are shortcuts that you can use, such as theme bw. Adding this to a ggplot command removes the gray background and makes it more black and white. You can go one step further and use theme minimal, or you can use any of the inbuilt options, light, dark, classic, things that change the way the theme works without having to set all of the individual components. Of course, you can create your own. For example, the BBC have created theirs, as has the Financial Times. And if you work in an organization that uses ggplot, you can create a new theme that matches your aesthetics. This isn't as simple as you could hope for, but it is just setting different arguments of the theme command. Themes can stack together. So in this case, theme bw is just theme gray with some additional settings. One thing to note is that to remove an element, use element blank in the theme argument. So theme bw is just theme gray with some additional changes. 
One thing I love about ggplot arguments is that these are hierarchical. This means that access text something something inherits from access text something, which inherits from access text, which inherits from text. So if I was to just change access text, everything below it in that hierarchy would also be changed. But there are too many of these to remember all of them, including all of the hierarchy. Plus, once you do use one of those arguments, you need to remember to set it to an element text object, which itself has other arguments. This is very powerful, but it does become somewhat complicated to use. That's great for programmers, but I thought computers were supposed to make life easier for the users. So enter ggeasy. Here is the cartoon we have at the top of our readme, in which a proficient R user is asked to enter a theme command without googling to disarm a bomb. It does not go well. The motivation of ggeasy is similar to the fact that we have theme bw. It's a shortcut to make life easier so that you don't have to set all the arguments yourself. Let's consider a common scenario. I want to rotate the x-axis labels of a plot to diagonal. In this case, I'm plotting the iris dataset with a box plot of petal width grouped by its species. If I want to change these axis labels to be diagonal, the proper way is with the theme command, setting the axis.text.x to an element text object with an angle of 45. Of course, this isn't quite perfect because these are centered. We also need to add a horizontal justification or hjust with the value one. I forget what this value is every single time and need to Google it myself. So how could we make this easier? We could take what we want to change, the labels, which of them we want to change, the angle we want to change it to, and the side we want to align to. So we have easy rotate labels. The which argument could be either the x, the y, or both. And we could align to either the left, the middle, or the right. The ggeasy version of this then looks like easy rotate labels, x to 45 degrees, aligned to the right. And we get the same thing that we got with the theme command. We can go one step further and put the x of which one we want to change into the function name itself. This helps with autocomplete when you know that you want to rotate the x labels. We also have rotate y labels. So in this case, setting rotate x labels to angle 45 aligned to the right, we get what we want. We have many functions in ggeasy. There is also some duplication here just to make autocomplete easier. One common use case that is often googled is to move the legend to the bottom. So we create a nice natural language way to do that. Also, if I wanted to set the text size to 16 and set the text color to red, we have an easy functions to do that. If you're not a fan of this spelling, we also have this one. And if you only wanted to set a particular element, you can set it specifically. I like to think that people who drive an automatic transmission vehicle should sometime learn how a manual transition works. In that vein, we have the teach argument which can be supplied to any ggeasy function. That will still produce the plot you want, but it will give you the full theme command that you should use if you wanted to go about it properly. I'd like to thank the developers who have worked on this package, in particular Alicia and Jonathan who have been helping with the core of this package. We've also had submissions from other people who have helped contribute. We're driven by users' needs. We have a PR that's still to be merged about changing the grid lines and another about changing the facet strips. But we're driven by what you find difficult to do. So in summary, theme is very sophisticated, but hard to remember. GGEasy provides shortcuts to common actions that are autocomplete friendly. GGEZ is hosted on CRAN and our universe, and we encourage you to check out our repo. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, Jonathan. That was uh, a great talk. Um, we actually also uh, already have a question. I guess you answered that one in chat. Um, so yeah, I admit I just installed package uh, GG Easy. Uh, thank you for that, at least from my side. Um, and there are a few more questions. Is there a GG Easy function that inverts GG Easy to see the manual version? I guess. Uh, so I guess the, the teach argument takes care of that. It will tell you what you should use to do that. Um, but I guess, yeah, I'm curious what you would expect to see from an inverted. I would assume that is what, what she meant. Yeah. As you enter the commands, the, um, the theme command can be written to the console. Well, I have a question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, since I have video on, uh, have you run into any cases of needing to support like multiple vocabularies for the same thing, or do you kind of have people settle on a single um, term, like you know, panel versus facet for examples? Do you try to accommodate people using those different ones, or maybe like you we, have to see? Yeah, we'd like to. So one of the examples, I guess, is the color argument that we've got both the spellings there. Um, We've also got to work on the actual arguments. ggplot does a little bit of translation in the background for the aesthetics. So you can provide a UR or OR there. Um, so yeah, I mean, even just things like people call that a different name, I'd love to be able to have a, a different function that just has that name in it. Cool, thank you. So there's another question from Jesse. Are all of the theme commands in there or is there anything you are still working on? Yeah, we're working on changing the grid lines at the moment. Uh, so I've got a, a PR that someone supplied for that one. There's also a suggestion for changing the strip, uh, either color, font, those sort of things. Haven't built that one yet, but we're working on it. Um, but if there's something there that you particularly find difficult to remember, then that's what we'd like to focus on. So I guess that's it. Um, thank you again, Jonathan. Um, and uh, let's move it to our first speaker, James Otto, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, here, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Hopefully you all can see this. I can't hear you. So if not, <laughs> hopefully someone will speak up. Um, so like you said, my name is James Otto. I am a doctoral candidate at the Department of Statistical Science at Bailey University. And today I'm going to be talking about our package GG Density, which I've been developing alongside my advisor, Dr. David Kale. GG Density is a uh, extension to ggplot2, which aims to provide um, improved density visualization. A little bit of background introduction. ggplot2 includes several ways to estimate and visualize densities for both univariate and bivariate data. Uh, but and this is especially true in the bivariate case. These methods are limited by the difficulty of interpreting just density height. That's not something that is very easy to um, understand looking at a graphic. And this is where GG density uh, extends ggplot2, uh, providing visualizations of estimated density surfaces uh, based on estimated highest density regions. So. A motivating example here is a sample of some bivariate standard normal data. This, this typical sort of point data that you want to visualize with estimated density contours. And uh, now on the left, we have the density contours that Geom Density 2D filled would make by default. So, what's happened here is G, uh, ggplot2 has constructed a kernel density estimator of this density surface in three dimensions using the uh, point data that we see on the right. Uh, it's taken that kernel density estimator, uh, looking at the minimum value of zero, the maximum value at the mode of 0.18, and uh, bend that range of values and plotted the resulting contours. Now, this is a useful graphic. We get a general sense for the shape of the estimated density surface. Uh, this is you know, where we can see that it's centered about the origin, for example. We also see that the uh, 
covariant structure is roughly circular as the contours are circular. Um, further, we get a general sense for the range of the data that we observed. However, these two plots are on the same scale, and you can see that the sort of lowest contour doesn't quite extend as far as you might expect. Um, but beyond these sort of uh, these observations, we don't get much more from this graphic. And like I said before, that comes from the fact that level, which is being plotted, refers to the estimated density height, which is just not an easy number to um, understand in the context of visualization. Now, for comparison, on the right, we have uh, a plot made by the function geom HDR, which is one of the functions included in GG density. This is a contour plot. These contours come from the same estimated density surface as uh, the plot on the left, except this time um, the contours have been chosen so that they represent what are called highest density regions. So what does that mean? On the right, we see the guide tells us that the innermost darkest region corresponds to a probability of 50%. So what that means is the innermost region is the smallest region that contains 50% of the estimated density. Uh, similarly, the 80% HDR contains 80% of the estimated density, so on and so on. So we get the same information that we got from the geom density 2D field graphic as far as the location, the you know, measure of centrality, the circular covariance, but we get additional information about the sort of probabilistic structure of this estimated density. As, um, for example, we know about 50% of our data points, not exactly, but about lay within that 50% HDR. Maybe we could talk about if we were going to generate more data, you know, about 50% would land in that 50% HDR, uh, just sort of domain specific uh, interpretations. So just summarizing briefly, advantages of plotting HDRs over those arbitrary density contours, which are generated by GM density to build, uh, there it boils down to them being inferentially relevant and just more interpretable. Now, what we're gonna talk about next is the fact that an estimated HDR depends on the underlying estimated density surface. So when we change our estimators, we get different HDRs. Uh, this goes from first to the following slide. Here's our first look into the GG density syntax, where we see uh, this geom HDR function. Like I said, GG density is an extension of ggplot2. It provides several geoms and stats that are used alongside the syntax, as you would expect. And in we see uh, they have various arguments here. We're specifying method to change that underlying uh, estimator. Uh, on the left, we have the default kernel density estimator, which matches. Um, the same, it is the same estimator that we have in GM density to be filled. James, in the middle, we have a plot. Yes. Sorry for interrupting. You might just switch off your camera, please. Your audio is really um, sure. deteriorating. Oh, and we can get better choppy? audio editing. Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sorry. For is, that. is that better? No, that's okay. Is that better? Do I need to go back at all? It's not really better. So that has not solved it. Okay, let me let me stop here and try one thing. I guess it's only fair to give you the opportunity. I'm just trying to see if closing out some background processes might help. Okay. Hopefully, can you hear me still? Yeah, we can hear you, but it's not it's not amazing, unfortunately. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, oh, maybe I could try. Sorry. <laughs> one one second. If if you're closer to the microphone, it works better, I presume. Maybe. Here is that an improvement at all? And. and very significant improvement. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's camera do that. back on, maybe would be yeah. great as well. Okay. Okay. Continue. So, what I was—I don't know if I need to go back at all. If it started cutting out at a certain point, um, 
If not, I'll just continue from where I left off. Just continue, I guess. Okay. So what I was talking about is here we have a couple, we, we have the first example of ggdensity code, um, the use of the geomhdr function to create visualizations of regions of highest density. Here we're specifying uh, this method argument, which allows us to uh, visualize HDRs estimated from underlying, from density estimators other than the kernel density estimate. We have on the left, the KDE, then the histogram, the multivariate normal parametric estimate of the density. Um, on the next slide, we have more plots that illustrate a variety of estimators that ggdensity allows uh, the users to use. So the first row is that same univariate, uh, sorry, unimodal uh, bivariate data. The middle column is a bimodal uh, example. And then finally, we have data with support constraints. And what we see is the multivariate normal estimator is very effective when that it, it's a great choice when the data uh, is close, you know, normal enough, bivariate normal enough. And we see that in the first row. We see though that it really fails uh, when that assumption is not appropriate as illustrated in the second and third rows. Uh, in the cases where that parametric estimator is not um, a good choice, we also have these non-parametric non estimators such as the KDE, histograms, or frequency polygon. Uh, they all have their own benefits and um, downsides. Uh, for example, the KDE is a great choice in the bimodal data, but when there's support constraints, KDEs are notorious for you know, uh, estimating positive probability in regions where there's no observed data. Uh, that's where a histogram might be a good choice, as we see here. So um, those were all of the um, methods for density estimation that we provide in ggdensity, but oh, sorry, in geom HDR. But there are actually other you know, ways to estimate and visualize HDRs from other densities, other parametric densities. And that's accomplished via this new function, geom HDR fun. So it works similarly to geom fun in that it accepts as an argument a function, uh, in this case, a, a function of two variables. Uh, it doesn't require any data to be provided to ggplot call. Um, well, that, that function just needs to be specifying a bivariate PDF or a bivariate PDF up to a multiplicative constant. And then ggdensity will internally uh, calculate numerically where these HDRs lie and plot them. Now, in this case, we've plotted the HDRs for this sort of joint normal gamma uh, probability distribution. But um, this isn't the main use case. The actual power comes from when we can estimate a parametric density uh, from the data and provide that estimated density function to geom HDR. Uh, here's a simple example where, again, we have that bivariate exponential data, which has support constraints. We've defined this uh, bivariate density in terms of x, y, and a vector of rates lambda. Uh, we know that the, the good choice of estimator for lambda is the NLE, which is just the column means in this case. Um, and so that's what we assign to the value of lambda hat. And then uh, we just call geom HDR fun, providing F and then providing the argument lambda hat, uh, which is again, that estimated lambda uh, via the args argument. It results in this plot. So here we have this bivariate exponential data and then the parametrically estimated HDRs underneath. Um, so this is a powerful tool. Uh, essentially, if you have data that you can pin down a likelihood or a density for, and then estimate the relevant parameters, uh, geomic HDR fun will plot those, uh, will plot contours of that density and not just contours, but the interpretable highest density regions. Um, this case was very simple where we just needed to you know, use uh, take the means of the columns, but this is applicable to you know, a wide class of problems where you might have to use optimization procedures for maximum likelihood. Uh, there's a more extended example in our documentation. So moving on to a couple of examples. First, we have the Palmer penguins data set, which has various measurements for three penguin species that are located in the Palmer Archipelago in, our, in, in, in Antarctica. 
Um, here we have a picture. Uh, and these species are visually distinct, and it turns out when you look at these visual, these uh, physical measurements, they are very separable, <laughs> which is nice because it makes good visualizations. Um, here we have three plots. They're similar. Uh, first is sort of default. So we're comparing flipper length and bill length between the three species. Uh, first, using GeomHDR from GGDensity. So um, in this case, it's very easy to, um, I've omitted the scale, but these three colors correspond to the three species of penguin. And it's easy to see that these are separable and see generally what's the flipper length and bill length of each of the three species. These aren't the default values of 50%, 80%, 90, 95, or 9099. Uh, instead, it's like the 30% HDR, 60%, uh, 80 and 95. Uh, that's just to make it more comparable with the ggplot2 graphics on the right, but the uh, interpretation of HDRs remains the same. Now, if we look at this middle plot from ggplot2, this is sort of what I got when I tried to re uh, replicate the ggdensity plot. It's what I imagine most people would uh, end up with. What's happened is ggplot2 has estimated the densities for the three groups, and then it has been the densities, but it's using the same breaks across all three groups. And those breaks are determined by the density that is most peaked. And that, in this case, it's the uh, orange, orangish density on the right. And so if a density is more diffuse, it you know, maybe has less of a presence in the graphic, which makes interpretation just a little bit more difficult all, you know, on top of having to deal with um, these rather uninterpretable uh, density heights. On the right, uh, this has been remedied by telling ggplot that we want normalized densities. Uh, just digging in the documentation, we can see that that's an option. So now it's a little bit more comparable, but we still don't have the interpretation of high density regions. Additionally, you might notice the graphic is just generally murky. And this has to do with the fact that uh, geom density to be filled by default puts ink sort of everywhere, even if there's no data that's been observed in that area. Uh, in contrast, GG density only plots out to, by default, like the 99% highest density region, uh, which avoids that problem. Uh, on the following slide, we have some of the code. I'm not going to go too into uh, detail, but notice that the geom HDR code is just what you would expect, where um, we're mapping to the fill aesthetic to get the colors. And that's all the effort it takes, whereas the geom density 2D filled uh, takes a little bit more finagling using the after stat function, for example. Uh, this is facilitated by the fact that GeomHDR by default maps the highest density region level to the opacity or to the alpha aesthetic, which frees up the fill or color aesthetic um, for displaying different groups. Um, just an example now, um, the ways that you can integrate ggdensity into ggplot2 code. Um, here, GeomHDR is just a layer in a ggplot2 graphic where we have on top of it a point layer. Both of them are inheriting the fill aesthetic um, according to species, and we fasted it. So a very like very simple code to make a powerful plot, um, which is sort of a hallmark of ggplot2, um, and just ggdensity slots right in because, as I said, it's, a, it's an extension. Uh, we're not providing wrapper functions that just generate sort of black box graphics. It's you know, it, specifically these layer or these geom functions that are being exported. So the last example that I have is the old faithful data set. So here we're plotting eruption time versus, or eruption duration versus waiting time for the old faithful geyser. Uh, this is just illustrating a couple of the geoms that I haven't been able to talk about so far. So we have geom HDR lines, which just is just like geom HDR, except now we're doing contour lines instead of filled contours. Uh, in, in the middle, we have geom HDR points, which is plotting a scatter plot of the data, but the points are colored according to the estimated uh, HDR membership. So the innermost points are in 50% HDR. Those are kind of yellow and moving out, we have the higher HDRs. Um, both this GM HDR lines and GM HDR points, both of these have fun analogs, which allow for the specification of an arbitrary uh, density instead of sort of estimating uh, internally. Finally, on the right, we have GM HDR rug, 
Uh, this provides a method of visualizing marginal HDRs instead of joint HDRs. You'll notice it's not quite as simple as just projecting the joint HDRs. These are quite different than what you might expect looking at the graphic on the left. Um, and so they're, they're informative and lots of times we end up plotting marginals alongside the joints. Um, all three of these functions, all three of these geons have method arguments. So this is illustrating the kernel density estimators, but we could do this with histograms or frequency polygons um, or uh, parametric normal models. Finally, uh, we have the geom HDR rug in the univariate case. So we're just looking at eruption duration this time, but it works just the same. Uh, and this time we've mapped the uh, HDR probabilities, not to the alpha aesthetic, but explicitly to the fill aesthetic. And we do find that sometimes this is preferable and it's certainly um, achievable with the ggplot2 syntax. I know I'm, I'm running out of time, but there are several related projects that I recommend uh, you look into if you're interested, uh, listed here. And uh, here are my references. And I just wanna say thank you. Uh, like, like I said, GG density is available on CRAN. Uh, we're about to push an update to it but uh, for all of the features that we saw today, for now, we'll have to look at uh, the GitHub repo, which is just GG Density. So thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, great that the audio worked out in the end. Uh, we had one question in the chat. I think you touched on that partly. Uh, Jonathan Burns asked, can you choose the various probability levels in GeomHDR or are they set? Yeah, and that's, you can, and that's illustrated here where We've just used this probs argument to choose these different four. Um, you could do any number of HDRs from you know one to however high you want, um, and it would work just the same. And I'm not a hundred percent sure whether I understand it, but I hope I think it relates to your talk. Um, Martin asked, uh, "Does this work in combination with maps made with the SF package?" So I don't know too much about the maps that the F, that the SF package might create, but I know that there are functions like geom SF. So um, you know, if if you have a ggplot2 graphic and one layer is a geom SF layer, then you could easily have another layer be a geom HDR layer, uh, in which case that would work out, I believe. The only concern I would have maybe would be how it deals with coordinate systems, but um, I think it would probably work out just fine. Okay, great. Um, Martin re uh, repeated the question, but I guess it's answered. Um, so then, uh, thank you, James, again. Um, let me just briefly say we have uh, 25 minutes left in the session. Uh, so if you, uh, if anybody has questions for the previous talks as well, we might have time for a general Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, so just please uh, put it in the Q&A section. And uh, without further ado, uh, Jun Cho, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, let me stop sharing. And everyone can see the slides okay? Hopefully, yes. Okay. Um, Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining my talk. My name is June. I'm a PhD student in linguistics at the University of Pennsylvania. And today I'll be talking about ggplot internals and my new package, ggtrace. So we've been seeing a lot of cool plots in this session today, but allow me to take us back to the boring basics. Imagine we want to make this box plot of palmer penguin species and the distribution of their flipper lengths in ggplot. What would we need to do? If we think of everything that goes into making a ggplot as like an iceberg, then we, the users, are up here. And as users, we need to grab the data set of penguin species and their flipper lengths and type in some short ggplot code. That gives us a plot that we want. But have you ever wondered how we got there? Like, where did the median and outliers come from? And where did the box plot shapes come from? The answer lies in what we call the ggplot internals. The internals are hidden from us below, and it takes over once we send off our ggplot code. Its job is to explicitly spell out the assumptions that are embedded in the concise ggplot code that we write. And for our box plot, this involves steps like identifying outliers, calculating the portiles, and drawing the individual graphical elements that make up the conventional box plot shape. If you've never had to think about these gritty, nitty gritty details of how a plot gets made, that's a good thing. It's actually intended 
in the design of the ggplot2 package that the user doesn't see the internals. But at the same time, this inaccessibility and foreignness of the internals makes us miss out on a lot of things. If we could just get our hands on these internal processes, we could do a lot of cool things and also learn more about ggplot along the way. This is what motivated me to write my package ggtrace, which is the topic of my talk today. ggtrace gives you a convenient interface to interact with ggplot internals without needing all the specialized knowledge that ggplot developers have. So here is the outline for my talk. First, I'll give a brief introduction to ggplot internals so that we have some shared knowledge and understanding of what we're talking about. Then I'm going to showcase some features from ggtrace. Um, I'll say more when we get there in like three minutes but I hope to convince you that ggtrace is useful no matter where you are in your ggplot journey. So let's begin our dive into the internals by first taking this box plot as an example. Beyond the data that the user provides, like variables and columns, what more information is needed to draw this? At a very low level, a box plot is a graphical representation of a bundle of summary statistics. So the internals must first compute the necessary summary statistics. Then it needs to distribute these new derived values across the individual graphical components of the box plot. For example, the quartiles are represented by the rectangle and the median is represented by the horizontal line segment. In the internals, these processes are handled by the so-called stat and geom processes, respectively. The stat and geom steps have a family of compute and draw functions. These functions live inside what are called ggproto objects. So you need to call these functions by subsetting these ggproto objects with a dollar sign as you would subset a regular list. But aside from that odd syntax, they're basically functions. Also notice how the compute and draw functions are split into the layer, panel, and group variants. These implement what's called a split apply combine process. To demonstrate, let's take the stat as an example. At the start, the compute layer function is called for each layer of our plot. And inside the compute layer function, the compute panel function is called for each panel or facet in the plot. Then inside the compute panel function, the compute group function is called for each group, like each of our penguin species represented by a box plot. And the same design applies to the geom stage as well, which happens after the stat stage. So draw layer is called for uh, one for each layer, draw panel for each facet, and draw group for each group. For those who are familiar with high-level functionals, this process is exactly like nested LApply or map. And for the dplyr folks in the room, the whole process that starts from the user supplied data all the way down to everything that's needed to draw a ggplot figure can be thought of as a long chain of pipes. And here, the split apply combined process is like a nested group by summarize call with mutate calls sprinkled in between. And again, the main point is this. The layer function is what you do for each layer. The panel function is what you do for each facet and the same idea for the group function. Now, let's take a moment to just step back and take in this beast of a pipeline. What would you do if you were handed this code and your task was to figure out what it does? Well, you might start asking questions about it, like what does the data look like for the second layer and the third panel at this point in the pipeline? Or what if I stick in my custom function here in the middle of the pipeline? What effect does this have down the line? And while many of us are comfortable enough with data wrangling to answer these questions ourselves, this is unfortunately not how the internals are written. We're instead forced to come back to the reality of having to deal with this annoying ggproto methods. And they're like nothing you've seen before. They defy common expectations about how a function should look like and behave. They're of class ggproto method and type closure, not function. Their arguments and body are not transparent. And they're also extremely difficult to debug. But it would still be nice to be able to answer questions about what goes on the internal pipeline. And that's where ggtrace comes in. ggtrace allows you to interact with the internals of ggplot with functions that let you inspect, capture, and hijack ggproto methods. This is implemented in a family of workflow functions in the form of ggtrace action value. These functions take three core arguments. The first argument x is the ggplot. The second argument method is the ggproto method. And the third argument con specifies when to interact with the method. So let's dive right in with our box plot example. Again, our box plot code maps the species column to the X and fill aesthetics, and the flipper length MM column to the Y aesthetic, and the geom box plot layer is called with width equal to 7, 0.7. Um, and we call it save our plot to a variable named P. So let's begin our dive into the internals with ggtrace for first the inspect family of functions. Starting with the compute layer method at the stat stage, 
let's see what input it was called with using the workflow function ggtrace inspect args. We use this function and call it with ggplot and the ggproto method as the first two arguments. And we set the third argument con to equal one. This tells the ggtrace function to inspect the compute layer method the first time it's called for our plot, which is the first and the only layer, the box plot layer. This is a default value of con, so we can actually omit it as well. Here, we find the compute layer was called with four arguments. The self and layout arguments here are the ggproto objects, and they're not relevant here, so let's instead turn to the more familiar looking params and data arguments. We see that params is a list, which includes the width equals 0.7 argument that we passed into the box plot layer at the start, along with some other useful default parameters. And we see that the data argument is the user supplied penguins data that's been slightly altered. Notice that the input data to the stat stage reflects the user supplied aesthetic mappings in the form of column names that are renamed to the actual names of the aesthetics, like fill, X, and Y. And also notice the presence of these new columns called panel and group, which are not aesthetics from the original ggplot code. These columns are added internally, and they're important because they control how the data later gets split up. When we count the rows of the input data by panel and group, we see one unique ID for panel because the plot only has one facet, and three unique IDs for group for our three penguin species. And finally, using ggtrace inspect return with the same arguments, we see that the output of compute layer is also a data frame. So by the end of the stat stage, the internal data associated with the box plot layer includes summary statistics like outliers listed in the outlier column and medians in the middle column. But of course, this doesn't happen all at once inside compute layer. We know that there's work being done at the panel and group levels too. And we can quickly confirm this using the function ggtrace inspect n, which returns how many times a ggproto method is called for a plot. We see that compute layer and compute panel are called once for our single box plot layer and single facet in the plot, and compute group is called three times for each of the penguin species. And at this point, you might notice how the stat ggproto was the one calling the compute layer and compute panel functions, and it was stat box plot that calls the compute group function. Really quickly, you can check what methods come from where using the get method inheritance function from ggtrace. Here, we extract the stat ggproto that's used by the geom box plot layer and pass it to this function to confirm that compute group comes from stat box plot, but compute layer and compute panel comes from the stat. Okay, back to the split apply combine. This time, let's look at how the data gets passed around and transformed between the compute functions. At the start, we have the input data to compute layer that we already saw. And because there's only one facet in the plot, the whole thing is passed down to compute panel without splitting. And then the data is split across three calls to compute group, which corresponds to the three penguin species in our data. And now we can also look at how the data is transformed and combined after it splits this way. Now starting backwards with compute group, the outputs of compute group are one row data frames containing the box plot summary statistics. And these outputs are combined and returned by the compute panel call that called them. And lastly, compute layer returns the same thing because again, there's no data from other panels to combine. And this is what we saw earlier with the inspect return function. So, so far we've been using the inspect family of functions to see how ggproto methods behave in the internals. But we can go even further with the capture family of functions, which allows us to keep interacting with ggproto methods outside of the internal pipeline. This function ggtrace capture fn here is called with the same three arguments and returns us a standalone function that copies the behavior of the compute group method when it was called. So this function returns the same data frame that we just saw from the compute group stage of the split apply combine when we call it with this default. And the really cool thing is this captured function comes with pre-filled arguments, which plays nicely with autocomplete as shown here. This makes it easy to play around with. You can see how decreasing the coefficient to the, for the whiskers to half by setting it to 0.8 results in more outliers identified. And we can also see that flipping the orientation of the box plots gives us column names like xmin and xmax instead of ymin and ymax. Relatedly, a family of hijack functions lets you quickly test hypotheses about what the plot would look like if something different happened in the internals. Here, we pass the same coef equals 0.8 as a list to the values argument of ggtrace hijack args. As expected, this shortens the whiskers of our first box plot and draws more outliers. And unlike the inspect and capture functions, hijack functions allow the condition to be triggered multiple times. So in this example, we set the cond argument to two and three, which targets the second and third box plots. 
and hijack the value of the width argument to point two, which shrinks these two box plots. Similarly, ggtrace hijack return allows you to modify the return value of a ggproto method. So here, we first grab the original output of stat compute group when it was first called, and then modify the y min and save it to this new variable. When we then pass this modified data into the value argument of ggtrace hijack return, it forces that same compute group method to return this new value instead. And down the line, when the geom receives this data from the stat stage, it doesn't know that it's been tampered with. So it happily gives you a box plot with a really long bottom whisker. Another cool that thing that we can do is supply an expression to be evaluated later in the method environment, like this one here created with the function poke. This is useful in conjunction with a special function called return value, which gives you the value about to be returned by the method. So this whole code here hijacks the original return value by extending the range of the whiskers for the second and third box plot, which gets reflected in the plot. OK, so far, we've only been doing stuff with the compute methods in the stat stage, but we can also do cool things with the draw methods in the geom stage. If we inspect the draw group methods, we see that the data in the input is, again, one of the input arguments. This data frame passed to draw group with is essentially the output from the stat stage with a couple extra columns. Now, the output of draw group methods might look unfamiliar, though. It's a special list with this class called grob, which stands for graphical object. These are the actual elements that get drawn to the plot, like the box plots. Working with grobs require you to know a little bit about the grid package, which is itself a whole other monster. But thankfully, ggtrace keeps the required knowledge of grid to a minimum by letting you piggyback on the work of draw functions. For example, you can get very far just using this edit grob function from grid, which takes a grob as its first argument and some things that you want to change about it, like the graphical parameters, which is what the gpar function does here. If we pass this modified grob with alpha equals 0.5 to ggtrace hijack return, then we get a plot where the first box plot is semi-transparent. And again, remember that you can do this more programmatically by constructing an expression that operates on return value. I also want to bring our attention to the fact that the box plot is a combination of graphical primitives. It's of a special grob called a gtree, which is a collection of grobs in a nested tree-like structure. The individual grobs of this G tree can be accessed through the children element, like so. So back in our hijack functions, we can use this knowledge to do things like remove the body of the box plot by setting the third element to null, or replace the whiskers with a version of itself that's thicker and dashed. And you can also just not draw specific components of the plot by making draw functions return a zero grob, which acts like an empty placeholder. This can be useful if you're presenting a plot of results and want to hide parts of it for narrative purposes. And lastly, just as a little something for those of you more familiar with grid, this is the power of being able to work within the context in which the grobs are created, not just the end results. Just three lines of code here in ggtrace hijack return can get you something looking very otherworldly, but still like a ggplot. And that's it. There is a lot more that ggtrace can do. Uh, so please check out the package website if you'd like to know more. Um, I hope I was able to convince you that ggplot internals isn't that scary and that ggtrace can empower learning by doing, which I'm sure many of us here are already experts at. Um, and of course, happy to answer any questions about ggtrace or ggplot internals or extending ggplot or any of that. Thanks. Thank you, June. Um, we actually have two questions, uh, one from Martin. Uh, Martin, sorry. Uh, hi, June. Uh, did you ever work with Geom Violin? And if so, uh, could you use these functions to make the fiscal area uh, of the violin the same when having multiple facets and multiple violins per facet? I suppose so. I think Geom Violin internally uses Geo, I think, stat Y density. So if you somehow scale the density such that they're you know, matched up with other um, groups in the facet, uh, instead of across facets, I think that's totally possible. You do get that information about facet groupings uh, when the violin calculates that. And then we have a further question by Jonathan Carroll. Uh, do you want to voice it yourself? Yeah, I can. Um, continuing, I guess, what I was talking about for shortcuts, uh, is the extraction of the box plot stats general enough that you could have something like a, an extract stats function? Uh, yes. So, um, all of the stat or like, this is basically how ggplot works. Um, the way, the reason why we can have ggplot as like a very extendable system is because 
you're recycling these same names like compute layer, compute panel, compute group, but just using them from different ggproto objects. So you could definitely make a recyclable function that looks at whatever stat the layer is using and then looking at what the compute group function of that stat layer is doing when the plot is being called. So that's very much possible. Cool. I, I know lots of people have always tried to get the same, like the edges of the boxes coming out of ggplot and then reuse that and try to recalculate it. It'd be really useful. Thank you. Yeah, I think I did that the other week. That's possible. Great. Uh, thank you, June, for the time being. Um, please, uh, if you have more questions, just put them into the session chat. Um, I will read a question uh, that's directed at Jonathan's talk uh, from uh, H. Sherry Zhang. Uh, from your point of view, would you wish users to rely on GGEZ for miscellaneous settings and themes? Or wish users learn to remember these commands through GGEasy. I, I guess I think one of the benefits of working with the code like this is it's up to you. Uh, I wouldn't force anyone to use anything in one particular way. The shortcuts are there to make life easier. The, the teach argument is there in case you want to learn how to do it properly. And I think the analogy of learning to drive works pretty well. Um, I wouldn't tell everyone you have to drive manual transmission all the time, but I think there's value in learning how that works. Great. Um, I guess we, we can interpret this as a question maybe. Uh, June, do you plan on releasing it on CRAN soon or uh, pushing it there? Yeah, I am in the process of figuring this out. Um, this package internally does some you know, hacky things with um, stack calls so that we can intercept the pipeline while it is running, um, which means that CRAN might not like this kind of you know, intrusive features um, going through their checks. Uh, I'm still yet to figure that out. Uh, but if you're curious, the, the function that powers this entire package is trace from the base package. It's a debugging function that lets you intercept the call um, and do things in the middle of what a function is doing, um, hence the name ggtrace. But I've never seen a package that uses these kinds of debugging functions that get onto CRAN. So it might be a little hard, but I'll try. Great. Then. Uh... I'm here to thank you uh, as the speakers uh, for all your uh, great and uh, inspiring talks. I thank the audience for all the uh, comments and questions we got. Uh, please make sure to reach out to the speakers individually if you have more comments. And uh, that is the end of learning GGplot2 for today at least. Thank you.